Welcome to Case in Point, produced by the University of Pennsylvania Law School. I'm your host, Steve Barnes. In this episode, we'll be looking at the migration crisis taking place across the Mideast, Africa, and the European Union. We'll examine its causes and, as well, what policy and legal responses can serve to mitigate a crisis that has resulted in over 3,000 dead and missing as of October this year. We're fortunate to have join us today two experts who can walk us through what's taking place and what responses, if any, may be appropriate. First, in studio, we have Professor Sarah Paoletti, who leads the Transnational Legal Clinic here at Penn Law. Joining us from Rome is Federico Soda, who is the International Organization for Migration's Chief of Mission in Italy and who's the director of IOM's coordinating office in the Mediterranean. Thank you both for joining us. So let's get started. Uh, Federico, if you could please, um, what are the causes of the crisis, perhaps the worst migration crisis in modern Europe? Well, the causes are uh, multifaceted and quite complicated. Uh, it is important to recognize that globally we're living in a period of unprecedented population movements that consist of both forced migration caused by conflicts and wars and persecution, as well as uh, other large-scale population movements caused by social, economic, and environmental factors. The distinction between these two causes is critical, both from the perspective of the individual migrant uh, as, and also from the perspective of governments trying to deal with uh, these flows, because those fleeing wars, conflict, and persecution are generally recognized as refugees, meaning that they have a right under international law to protection by the countries that they flee to. In other words, they can't be turned back. Whereas the other migrants moving for social and economic reasons, so-called economic migrants, are not necessarily entitled to the same level of protection. And today, they actually represent the vast majority of people on the move. So um, this includes a large proportion of those arriving in Europe. The populations reach, reaching Europe and indeed consist both of persons from refugee produced countries such as Syria, Afghanistan and Eritrea and other countries that people are leaving in search of better opportunities and livelihoods. In Italy, for example, of the nearly 140,000 people that arrived this year, uh, as of October, perhaps half of them could be economic migrants. So it's not just a refugee crisis, but it's, it's a very complicated situation of what we call mixed migration flows. Did you want to add to that? Or? Sure. I mean, I think that the, the answer highlights the, the challenges with the current legal system, right? We have a legal system that governs human migration that is grounded in sort of the post-World War II era. Uh, and so the notion of the kind of forced versus voluntary migration dichotomy creates a, a unique challenge under the legal system uh, and I think doesn't necessarily reflect the reality of the lives of the individuals fleeing. So to call economic migrants voluntary migrants ignores the reality that without some level of human migration, they can't support their family, they can't eat, they can't work. So you have areas of conflict, you have areas of environmental disaster or environmental crisis or economic crisis um, where folks really feel like they have no choice but to move to survive. It may not be that they fall under the definition of a refugee for legal protection under the traditional forced migration uh, and refugee definition, but the reality is the, the nature of conflict and the nature of sort of where the world is shifting in human migration. Uh, more people are moving out of necessity for survival, um, even if it's not under the traditional refugee definition. Sarah's point is, is really important because um, I think in the medium to long term, we can expect um, Hopefully the major conflicts to end, but we will um, still have to deal with uh, major population movements driven by social and economic factors and the fact that disparity, including demographic between uh, aging populations in the global north and youthful populations in the global south, is going to be with us uh, for decades to come. And we know that from, the, from looking at the current uh, population uh, structures. So um, this is partly resulting in these demographic pressures and, and socioeconomic pressures are also resulting in 
the uh, high rates of irregular and very dangerous migration, often in the hands of crim criminal networks that smuggle people, because we have a, uh, a lack of uh, legal channels for people to migrate safely in orderly ways, even when uh, there are uh, opportunities for them to be gainfully employed and be productive members of society in another country. Great. So just to step back a bit further then, um, Federico, if you could, could you explain to us sort of what the scope of the crisis is? That is to say, how many people right now are attempting to migrate to and seek asylum in Europe? The scope of the crisis uh, is, is really, um, this year has really been accentuated, I think. Um, we have had over 600,000 migrants uh, and refugees reach Europe as of October 2015. This consists of approximately uh, 480,000 in Greece and 140,000 uh, in Italy. Uh, Malta and Spain are also uh, part of the picture, but in a very, very small way, because together they've only received a few thousand. Now, um, the story of 2015 really is uh, Greece, in the sense that while in Italy uh, 140,000 uh, is a very high number, uh, in 2014, Italy had, uh, in all of 2014, Italy had 170,000 uh, migrants and refugees arrive uh, by sea. Whereas, uh, so we're roughly on track for uh, the same number in 2015. Whereas in Greece, we have seen uh, really uh, an exponential increase from uh, just over 32,000 uh, in 2014 to, as I said, 480,000 so far this year in 2015. That's over a thousand percent increase. Uh, now, the vast majority of those arriving uh, do claim asylum. Not all will be recognized and given uh, some type of uh, permanent protection, because as I mentioned, it, particularly in the central Mediterranean, the numbers, uh, the numbers and the composition of the flows is very mixed. Uh, it's a big number, 600,000, but Europe is a big and uh, still uh, wealthy uh, continent. And it has a population of well over 500 million. And I think that um, even if we were to get to a million arrivals this year, uh, these are numbers that should be manageable with the right programs and policies in place. Yeah, I think that's a really important point. I mean, we've seen that in the United States uh, with the, the so-called border crisis and the wave of refugees or the surge of refugees that came up from Central America uh, two summers ago. The numbers are increasing. I think what you see is a disproportionate hit in certain countries in Europe. But to recognize that in terms of overall human migration, uh, being careful of the rhetoric that we use, because uh, the rhetoric of waves and surges and crises tend to create uh, responses that are uh, disproportionate, maybe, uh, in terms of reactionary as opposed to thoughtful. Um, and so to recognize that this is a trend, uh, perhaps a trend to recognize that there are ebbs and flows of migration, uh, but also to recognize that while the EU can likely absorb the, the refugees that are coming in and all the migrants that are coming in, uh, even if we were to expand legal channels for, for the migrants that are coming, the rest of the world has an obligation too. And so we need to really be thinking about this as a global issue and not exclusively as a regional issue. Great. So as of this taping, which is October, late October 2015, we've seen in the media uh, images and news stories about uh, migrants trying to transit through Europe to get to countries that are more welcoming than others. So first to you, Federico. Um, first, how are these migrants and refugees transiting into Europe? How are they getting to Europe? And with that, how are the individual EU countries responding to this influx of migrants? Well, there are two uh, major 
uh, routes into Europe at this uh, at this point in time. Um, the first route I would uh, characterize as the Eastern Mediterranean uh, route, which is uh, through uh, Turkey into Greece, and then up through the Western Balkans into uh, into into the rest of Europe. Um, and this flow consists uh, primarily of uh, Syrian refugees, but also other populations from uh, further east as far as uh, Afghanistan. Um, the other route is the Central Mediterranean route, which is uh, basically uh, between Libya and um, southern Italy. Um, but what's important about this route is that, in fact, in Libya, we have the convergence of two other uh, African routes, one from the uh, Horn of Africa from Somalia and Eritrea up through Sudan and into Libya, and the other one across West Africa through Niger and up into Libya. So two very, very different uh, routes converging there because while from the east we have some refugee-producing countries in West Africa, that is much less uh, the case. And then when we come back to this uh, this discussion about the composition of the flows and how they are mixed by different motivations, and indeed the numbers in Italy demonstrate that. Now, in, in terms of how the EU is responding, I think that um, the response of the EU has evolved uh, a lot in the last uh, in the last eight months, probably um, with major turning points in April of uh, 2015. Um, which coincidentally was a period of very, very uh, significant loss of life in the Mediterranean, which I think uh, contributed to uh, a more uh, a more robust uh, and uh, comprehensive response by the EU. The approach that the EU has is um, is trying to be really as as multifaceted uh, as possible, consisting of both. Uh, short-term solutions, such as, for example, the reducing the loss of life at sea through uh, rescue operations in the Mediterranean, um, and also longer-term objectives uh, aimed at um, where possible, not in the cases of of conflicts, but uh, in 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 cases where the migration is driven by social and economic uh, factors, aiming at stemming. Uh, the uh, push factors. In other words, promoting um, uh, growth and development in, the, in, in countries of origin so that migration can become more of a choice than really the only resort for people to improve uh, their lives. There are also European responses related to um, the resettlement of uh, refugees directly from um, let's say countries where that they where they are displaced. Uh, predominantly, the, the the trend right now is out of out of is Syrians out of Lebanon into Europe, um, and also a relocation program within Europe to try and more evenly distribute uh, the burden uh, among the EU member states away from uh, the the countries of uh, of entry, Greece and, and Italy. And, and a more more equitable distribution of refugees uh, throughout Europe. There is still very much a heavy emphasis on uh, security, border control, and also maritime um, security, military uh, through mil by military means. Um, these are all part of the EU's comprehensive uh, EU's efforts to provide a comprehensive response. So, to pull that string a bit, Federico, we learned over the weekend, again, this is late October 2015, that Hungary had closed its borders to the influx of migrants coming to it, and uh, migrants in Slovenia and elsewhere were trying to find another route, and that states in the EU were trying to find another uh, pathway, if you will, for these migrants seeking, seeking to get to more immigration-friendly countries. Could you comment mm -hmm. a bit on that, please? Well, um, yeah, I think that uh, a number, you know, Hungary has been the most um, 
the most uh, standout uh, example of, of an effort to uh, put up uh, walls and, and barriers to try and prevent entry. Um, others um, have tried or uh, indeed have even um, suspended, um, uh, temporarily suspended the freedom of, of movement um, within uh, the EU, uh, the EU bloc. Um, but uh, what we see uh, always in these situations is that uh, basically the only, the only uh, main uh, consequence of those actions is that indeed uh, alternate routes will be found um, by, the, uh, by the refugees or, and, and migrants. Um, we have had this year um, only a few hundred, but uh, we have had uh, migrants cross all of Russia and enter the EU from uh, northern Finland. Um, so that is, just to give you an idea, that is the extent to which um, these, uh, the, that, that, is, that is the extent to which these pressures uh, compel, these push factors compel people to seek uh, uh, safety and, and, uh, and opportunities. Um, it's also referred to by some as the balloon effect. In other words, um, you can, you know, you squeeze down in a balloon and you might be able to uh, kind of contain uh, that part of it, but uh, inevitably it'll, it'll pop out um, somewhere else. The pressure has to go somewhere. And that's, that's really what we're talking about. So, of course, uh, maintaining the integrity of, of borders and, and the security of borders is a sovereign right, and it's something that uh, countries uh, need to do also with respect to, uh, the, to confidence uh, of, of, their, of their nations that, uh, that the borders are being uh, well managed. Sarah? Yeah, I mean, I think this highlights, and, and Federico's response highlights the tensions of the EU operating in an immigration system, right? Uh, so you have the EU operating in a cooperative, in an arguably cooperative system with the Dublin Agreement, um, whereby this first country is required to do the processing or expected to do the processing. Once that first country does the processing, they are legally obligated to those that they have identified as refugees. Uh, and so then the share becomes disproportionate among the EU. Um, while at the same time there is this notion of freedom of movement within the EU. So it's a real tension of the boundaries and sovereign rights within the EU that's being highlighted by this. Um, but I think the, the argument um, that Federico is making or the, the statement that Federico is making about when you have migrants, if somebody is desperate enough to leave their home, they're going to leave their home. Uh, and again, just to, to look at the United States as an analogy, um, you see border walls being put up right along the Mexico border. People are finding ways to get to the United States if they have to. Um, and they are going by more dangerous routes. They are doing it at, at greater personal cost, greater financial cost, arguably greater environmental cost. Uh, and so that you see movements continue. It's not going to stop the movement. Uh, and the notion that putting up barriers and putting up walls is going to stop the flow of migration and that welcoming and having a, a safe channel of migration and a process that ensures the fundamental rights of human beings is a pull factor, I think, ignores the reality of why people actually leave their homes in the first place. And many of these people are actually leaving, uh, or, or sorry, they're bound for countries where they know that they will find uh, communities of their own nationality or uh, indeed uh, even to uh, be reunited with uh, family members or extended family members. So um, there is also uh, this aspect of the trends and flows that we are seeing which uh, should, not, uh, should not be underestimated. I mean, the fact that uh, certain, uh, certain uh, nationalities, certain people are attracted to specific countries is also due to 
to the fact that they have um, family relatives or cultural ties to that country, which is which I think underscores Sarah's point about uh, how strong uh, the motivation uh, is as well. Great. So on that note, uh, Federico and also Sarah, uh, what are other international actors doing? So for example, the United Nations and organizations like the International Organization for Migration. And on, on top of that question, if you could please, what kind of coordination, if any, is taking place among these UN agencies and organizations, intergovernmental organizations? Well, this is a big question because we're talking about uh, really a, a very big uh, geographic area uh, when we're, we, you know, if we look at Southern Europe and what's happening here, and then of course uh, the Middle East uh, and parts of North Africa. Um, but uh, basically, of course, um, the entire United Nations system and uh, IOM are very much engaged in the areas uh, immediately uh, close to uh, the conflict, or indeed in some, in some cases, right in the conflict areas themselves. And here, uh, our work, our collective work and efforts consists primarily of um, humanitarian assistance, life-saving assistance, uh, um, and then into some of the camps in basically providing uh, essential uh, essential services and support uh, for the populations that are, are uh, residing. Um, I'm very much involved in uh, countries of origin uh, throughout the geographic area of sub-Saharan Africa and the Middle East. We are present in all of the countries and uh, in all of them we are working with the migrants or the mobile communities the uh, government authorities and civil society to uh, indeed try and make the way that migration takes place uh, safer, more regular, and uh, in a way that is, uh, is more beneficial, first to the migrant, but also to uh, the countries that are uh, affected by it. Now, in Southern Europe, um, the the activity of uh, the UN system as a whole is a little bit more, more limited, but uh, IOM and, and UNHCR are, uh, are very active in both um, Italy uh, and Greece. Um, we uh, work in Italy. I have teams in southern Italy that are uh, at the disembarkment points. Uh, when the uh, the migrants, uh, having been rescued by by uh, the navy or the coast guard, uh, reach uh, reach land, uh, we are there to uh, provide uh, information and counseling about the next steps, as well as to start screening for the most vulnerable uh, people and uh, and basically inform them about the protection that they might be entitled to. And I'm, in terms of IOM's work, we per have a particular focus on unaccompanied minors and victims of trafficking, which we consider to be among uh, the most uh, vulnerable. Our work is part of the government's uh, response. We then uh, refer uh, these uh, uh, identified people uh, for assistance and uh, work with the government on follow-up uh, related work. Beyond that, I think that there's a very strong communi community of advocacy uh, at all levels, at the international level and certainly at the EU level, uh, which, uh, which involves uh, the, the United uh, Nations system, uh, IOM, civil society, also a lot of faith-based groups, uh, really trying to uh, bring some uh, some some sense to a, dis a discussion to a topic that unfortunately has become uh, very very toxic in many political contexts, uh, and really also to try and uh, help people understand uh, what it is that we're facing, why we're facing it, what uh, what uh, you know the suffering that uh, millions of people are living through right now, 
and to bring a bit a bit more compassion to the discussion uh, as well, because I think that it is also by trying to understand a little bit uh, where people are coming from and why that we might be able to have more sustainable and and reasonable uh, policies and programs. Great, thank you, Sarah. Yeah, I mean, I think that comment, Federico's comment about the, the toxicity of the arguments um, that, that you see in coming out of Hungary, that you see uh, coming out of countries where there's just a, a fear of mass migration, right? And that's why I mentioned earlier the use of the language crisis, wage, surge, right? That sort of make it sound like this uncontrollable, massive migration that's going to take over a country becomes really problematic in devising solutions. Um, and I think it highlights the need for greater cooperation, the need for greater engagement of civil society and the faith-based communities to help humanize the stories uh, and, and make them more real and make people help people understand why people migrate. Uh, it highlights the challenge in language more generally um, that evolves in part from the legal system of this forced migration versus voluntary migration. Al Jazeera at one point announced that they were going to refer to all of the migrants as refugees. Well, legally, that's actually not accurate. And I would argue potentially more harmful than good, right? It recognizes that people are being forced to leave, but it also delegitimizes those migrants who may not qualify as refugees in terms of the rights and the protections that they may have. Um, so I think thinking about kind of the language is important. Um, in terms of international cooperation, I think from the advocacy community, civil society, um, it's been noted the, the lack of a public role UNHCR has necessarily taken. The United Nations High um, Commission for Refugees. Yes, the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees in, in being a more forceful voice for the migrants. And I think partly it is it's a resource issue. It's, a, it's a, an issue of dealing with the immediate crisis and the humanitarian needs. Um, but it also highlights, I think, the tensions of mixed migration flows. Who's taking responsibility for whom? Who's recognizing the rights of whom? Is this about migration management? Is this about human rights protection? Um, and I think if we can try to shift the language, shift the debate, um, and shift the solutions to a more human rights oriented dialogue, we'll see more progress. Um, just going back, you know, uh, 30, 40 years, um, 30 years, if you look at law refugee crises over time, um, you've seen that the historical response on a refugee crisis is to house people, to provide immediate needs, provide for immediate needs with the assumption that repatriation is the ultimate goal, right? The ultimate durable solution that the UN High Commissioner for Refugees and others always talk about is repatriation. Um, and just two years ago, we were in uh, Geneva meeting with representatives from the UN High Commissioner for Refugees, for UNICEF, uh, and some of the other, for the UN uh, Development Program and some of the other UN agencies around refugees who had been in a Liberian refugee camp in Ghana for nearly 20 years. Um, and after 20 years, while repatriation may have been an option in terms of what Liberia may or may not have offered, psychologically, emotionally, and economically, it was not a viable option for those refugees. Uh, and so we were talking about protracted refugee crises and the need for a more coordinated response on protracted refugee crises. And two years ago, um, the response uniformly across the board, including the, the Red Cross and other agencies, was that the Syrian crisis has people thinking differently about durable solutions um, and protracted crises. And so we can't be thinking about temporarily housing people in camps and then with the goal of repatriation. Now, they had the three durable solutions, repatriation, reintegration into the country that was hosting them, uh, or resettlement. Um, resettlement was almost always the desire of the refugees, rarely the desire, the, the reality of the international community. Uh, and I think with Syria, folks were realizing this is a longer, more protracted crisis. Um, it's going to be a long term before there is a solution. Uh, and so we need to think about what is sustainable longer term. And so you haven't really heard 
in this current debate, present day debate, the notion of housing people, although countries are, um, with the eye towards sending them back. It is thinking about longer term solutions. Uh, and I think the fact that it is a longer term, more protracted crisis makes it uh, an important opportunity to reevaluate the international system of cooperation, the international legal frameworks that govern human migration, um, but also the solutions that we're talking about. It also influences how communities view the refugees. Um, they are not just sort of welcoming them as guests for a short-term humanitarian crisis. They're thinking longer term, what are the impacts, what are the implications? Uh, and so bringing in organizations like uh, the UN Development Program to think about where do, how do the refugees contribute to development policies, programs, what are some of the training programs we need to establish to really truly integrate and resettle refugees in a meaningful way, um, or migrants um, thinking about human migration, how you can maximize the benefits of human migration in a way still that recognizes the fundamental human rights of the migrants themselves. Great. So um, you, you, you touched upon one of the questions I had, which was what more can national or international actors still do or should be doing now? And Federico, if you either want to respond to what Sarah just said or answer that question, sort of what more needs to be done and, and by whom both uh, both sovereign nation states as well as the international community? Well, I think that um, the latter part of your question is, is part of the answer. Uh, it is the international community. I mean, uh, the scope of, if we're talking about uh, those uh, being pushed by conflicts and wars, uh, the burden uh, of dealing with the consequences of war and all its aspects uh, lies within among us all. Um, this is not something that um, the EU, certainly no country in the EU, and not even as the EU as a bloc, can deal with uh, on its own. We're talking about millions of uh, people uh, displaced uh, worldwide, where we have the highest number of uh, people uh, displaced since uh, the Second World War. We have a growing list of complex crises around the world. We seem to be adding to that list more often than we are taking countries off of that list. That is something that I think we all need to be uh, extremely concerned about, and I think we all have a responsibility towards those uh, states in crises, as well as those that are highly fragile and, 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 and could, could very easily slip uh, in, into crises. So I think that um, a much more concerted uh, international effort is needed. Um, we have had such efforts in the past before. Um, you know, IOM, both IOM and the UNHCR were founded uh, in 1951 to deal with the consequences of the displacement of, of World War II for IOM and the 1951 convention and the subsequent 57 protocol for UNHCR. So, uh, you know, big bold steps were taken then to deal with uh, a large scale crises. I think we came together uh, also in the after the Indochina Wars, uh, with the resettlement of millions of people, who many of whom went to the United States, but many, many other countries around the world took, uh, took people from uh, Southeast Asia uh, that, needed, uh, that needed protection. So we're not thinking in those terms right now. We're not talking uh, about this problem in those terms yet. Uh, we, don't have, uh, we don't have solutions for uh, the, the conflicts and wars that uh, are, are, plaguing, are plaguing us. And so, um, you know, I think we need, we need bold leadership and uh, bold uh, ideas and the courage to implement them at the highest level. Okay. Yeah, so um, I think what this highlights is that this is a human migration is a symptom, not the problem. Uh, and as long as we talk about human migration as the problem, we're going to be trapped in 
in our creativity and thought processes and, and cooperation around finding sustainable solutions. Uh, so I think we do need to, to recognize that human migration is a symptom of bigger problems and that um, we need to be thinking about what causes human migration, the causes of human migration, and the impact of human migration in all of our, in everything that we do as, as actors on the inter in the international community. Um, within the Americas in 1984, they passed the Cartagena Declaration, uh, which expands the scope of who is a refugee and recognizes massive human rights violations and other causes that create forced migration. Uh, it's not a binding treaty, right? It doesn't bind countries, but it's a new way to start thinking about um, migration, breaks the, the false dichotomy that I think exists between forced migration and voluntary migration, and has us just thinking differently about globalization. We open up our trade, you know, we open up trade, um, and we talk about the need for freedom of, of movement of goods and services. Um, a lot of those services are human provided services. Uh, and so I think we need to think more differently about people uh, and their human rights in the process. Great, thank you. So you talked uh, a bit already about, the, about some of these things, but um, noting that this is an ongoing crisis, it, it, it seems to not have a clear finite end at this point. So what are, the, some of the, what are some of the possible domestic and international legal frameworks uh, that exist to address address this crisis, particularly its ongoing nature. And just a general question, who is advocating for migrants in the legal sphere? Um, so to start with your, your last question, who is advocating for migrants, you have those who are doing direct service representation, right? Those who are directly trying to represent individuals. Um, one of the things you've seen in the United States is a real push to recognize the right of individuals in, who are seeking asylum to have legal representation. Uh, to make sure that they have a fair chance to adjudicate their claims. The preparation of an asylum case, the preparation that's required, the evidence that's required to put together a story of who is a refugee, who even falls into that more narrow scope of who's entitled to, to legal protection under the international legal system, is, is a big job. It takes a lot of time, it takes a lot of work, it takes a lot of thought. Um, and it's not the story that a person articulates, right? When a person is fleeing and arrives at a border and is in detention um, and being interviewed by an officer, they are not are necessarily articulating the story that satisfies the legal definition. They're articulating their human experience. Um, and it takes, takes time and, and representation. And so there's a big push in, in among the legal advocacy community, the direct services community. Um, as, as Federico mentioned, the faith-based community, I think, plays a very large role. Um, obviously, the Pope. Uh, on his visit to the United States made a lot of comments and, and directed a lot of his energies and attention to the issue of human migration uh, and the rights of migrants and recognizing the rights of migrants. And so I think the faith-based community plays a lead role. Um, until we can shift the little bit more, the, the nature of the debate and the, the rhetoric of the debate I think the politics of the human migration advocacy is always going to, we're going to be trapped. Um, and so we really do need to do more um, on, a, on a more human level to, to humanize the story and the, the nature of the crisis in the long term. Um, advocacy that needs to happen really does require a little bit of a cultural shift in how we think about uh, humans who migrate, why they migrate, and what they're, what they're doing and what their stories are. Um, when you tell the individual story, that resonates. When you talk about the mass issue, uh, people glaze over, people get scared, uh, and it interferes with the development of solutions. Um, I think the international agencies that are trying to manage migration can do more to think about their role as advocates um, in trying to shift some of the debate and some of the policy as well. Okay. Federico? Yeah, I, I agree with, uh, with all of that. Um, I think one of the challenges is that um, in the political theater, the message uh, of uh, why uh, it is important uh, and uh, in our collective best interest to uh, better uh, deal with uh, these, uh, these migration flows, to be 
more open to other uh, other uh, cultures and society, both in terms of the refugees, but I think in terms of foreigners uh, uh, generally, uh, is a much, much more difficult message to sell than um, the other one. And I don't want to say that, uh, I don't want to paint a broad brush uh, over uh, all of the political debates, but... Um, there are very, it's very, very easy for uh, the discussion to uh, reach uh, basically the lowest common denominator uh, in terms of the, uh, in terms of oversimplifying uh, the issue and uh, and the social and economic uh, imp- consequences and implications. Um, this means also that. In the political theater, uh, when we have uh, our leaders make a very, uh, very uh, negative uh, remarks about uh, either migrants or refugees or uh, or uh, foreign uh, nationalities in, in general, um, it has a devastating effect on um, advocacy that is being done uh, to inform and educate. Uh, the public about really the truth, because uh, most of what uh, is being sold that is anti-immigration is is myth. Uh, the research shows that, the studies show that. We know that uh, the movement of people uh, between countries uh, is is for the most part overwhelmingly positive already, uh, and we know that with better management and better governance and and smarter policies that also help our own countries deal with our own, uh, for example, labor market shortages or shortages of skills and talent and so on, we know that we can benefit much more from it. And and those coming will benefit as well. And also from the perspective of the countries of origin, we know that migration is a fantastic bridge builder between countries of origin and countries of destination, and amazing things can happen in in terms of development or co-development uh, between be, between countries uh, through through migrants. I'm per- I'm personally very very concerned about the level of misunderstanding of what is happening uh, right now uh, globally, and the misunderstanding about. Uh, about migration issues and uh, and the tension, the social tension that this uh, potentially uh, creates, or that indeed we've already seen, uh, we, we've we've already seen in some contexts. I think it's extremely dangerous, and I cannot imagine that these are the kind of societies that we want to build and leave for our, the future generations. Great. Um, so, last question, uh, Sarah. First, with you. Based on your experiences in other geographies and contexts, such as Latin America or elsewhere where you've done work, um, what do you think nations can do to better manage the influx of uh, migrants and those seeking asylum? Um, Sort of a sidebar question to that, and to also better anticipate and prepare for crises like this one. Um, So that's a... Right, that's the the ultimate question, right? The ultimate question of what do we what do we do? How do we prepare? How do we get ready? Um, and I think a challenging question, uh, but one again that rec- that needs to recognize each individual as a human being uh, who is a possessor of fundamental human rights. Right, I think is a is a fundamental issue. The recognition of individuals who are migrating as human beings who are subject to their human rights who are subject to human rights um, is critical uh, and. Um, if we don't do that, then we risk solutions that undermine rights and ultimately create more problems. Uh, so, for example, in looking in Latin America and the United States, there's a big open question now about the role of U.S. support for immigration enforcement out of Mexico uh, and what that's doing in terms, of prote- in terms of preventing asylum seekers from getting to the U.S. and seeking safety. Um, the challenges that individuals face in trying to migrate 
um, from Latin America, from Central America, Honduras, Guatemala, El Salvador, into the United States are tremendous, and the number of rights violations that they experience are tremendous. And um, the the advocates for human rights in Minnesota coined the term around the Liberian refugees, uh, the triple trauma paradigm. Right? There's the trauma that causes people to leave. There's the trauma that they experience in transit, and then there's the trauma that they experience in their destination country and trying to to resettle. Uh, and build their new lives. And so I think we need to recognize that. Um, and if we start from a, a more human perspective, we'll be in a better position. Um, again, I referenced the Cartagena Declaration. I think we do need to re-examine our system for managing migration. Um, and thinking about the Refugee Convention as a human rights convention, um, migration management is seen differently, right? And then it looks at these sort of notions of guest worker programs and temporary labor migration and filling labor shortages. When you start to do that and you take a business oriented approach, um, you create systems that further undermine the rights of migrants, um, further undermine their communities at home. Um, you have increase in human trafficking. Uh, and so we need to be careful that in looking for migration management systems, we are always mindful of the, the human rights system, look at this as a human rights issue, um, to allow for a broader recognition of a definition of who's entitled to protection in the migration flow. Okay. Federico? I think that um, for the most part, the vast majorities of countries uh, around the world uh, do not uh, perceive migration as a social and economic uh, issue or they don't look at it from that dimension. It is still uh, very much uh, looked at from the perspective of uh, sovereign right, uh, security, border control. And I think that, you know, by definition, international migration involves more than one country. It cannot be, um, it, it is not something that can be uh, managed effectively um, unilaterally. I think that in this regard, uh, partnership, dialogue, and more openness about uh, migration, it's all, all of its aspects, the good and the bad, uh, need to be much, much more uh, at the forefront of, uh, of national uh, policies, programs, as well as bilateral and, and, and multilateral uh, relations. Um, I think that, uh, again, I mentioned it earlier, migration is overwhelmingly positive for, 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 for migrants and for society as a whole. Uh, that is the case when it is, it is safe um, and it is, it is orderly. Uh, what we need to move beyond is the current state um, where a, an, a, a lot of um, migration for a lot of people uh, looking for better li livelihoods and opportunities is conducted at the, in the hands of criminals because there aren't legal channels for them to move safely. So we need to move from uh, unsafe and dangerous migration in the hands of criminals to more open legal channels for orderly migration that can benefit everyone and reduces the social costs that are inevitably a consequence of dangerous, irregular uh, migration. Um, I think that we will always have to deal with shocks and unexpected events, uh, like the current uh, conflicts in some par parts of the world. But um, better national policies and better collaboration can help us uh, uh, deal with these shocks when we are confronted with them. And I think that at all levels of social and economic development of, of, of countries around the world, we need to do much, much more to make migration part of the economic and growth planning because it can be a major contributor uh, to uh, so the, uh, growth and development plans. And I'm not just singling out uh, you know, developing countries or the global south. This is, uh, this is an issue 
that is of interest to uh, to 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 all to all countries, uh, wealthy and less so. Okay, Sarah. Yeah, I just want to add one one point, which is I think what we often see uh, in the migration debate um, is the discussions happen either at a certain level at the UN, at a certain level between countries, and then there's the advocacy that happens. And I think this really is an area where civil society and the faith-based communities need to be more directly engaged and involved with the international community. Um, the international agencies and the international political actors need to reach out more and do more with civil society and the faith-based communities. Um, those are the communities that tend to be more prepared in the crisis situation uh, to handle the crisis. Uh, they can help provide the services. It, it sort of takes the shift away from a reactionary approach, uh, but it also makes for a more comprehensive approach and more comprehensive thinking about solution building. Great. Well, uh, Federico Soda in Rome at IOM, uh, Professor Sarah Paoletti here at Penn Law. I want to thank you both for a uh, very great and clarifying discussion about a highly complex issue, or rather set of issues. So thank you both for joining us here today at uh, Case in Point.